Thanks. They look like people mostly. Just come in a minute. Sure, sure. Okay, let's start the session. Welcome everyone. A very good afternoon from CCMB. This is a special session given the times of Omicron. And uh, as you might all be aware of CCMB's involvement in COVID-19 mitigation, and that has not kept us away from understanding Omicron variant of the coronavirus as well. In this session today, we have CCMB Director, Dr. Vinay Nandikuri, and um, uh, Dr. Divya Ded Saupati, who has been looking into Omicron genome, uh, I mean, coronavirus genome variants, Omicron is one of them, and Dr. Karthik Bharadwaj, a clinician scientist at CCMB, who is also a part of the vaccine studies uh, that CCMB has been undertaking. So today, we will be understanding the general biology of the virus and the disease COVID-19, as well as understanding the variant Omicron in a little, little bit more detail as in what does this variant do? What are the symptoms like? What effect does the vaccine have on this variant? And many others that you might be have many other doubts that you might be having in your mind. Let's start with Dr. Vinay Nandipuri with the general biology of the virus and the disease. Vinay, over to you. I hope I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> what I would do over the next 20 minutes or so is to talk about virus, I mean, generally about the infections. And at a later point of time, I would give it over to Tej, uh, to who talk about uh, genome sequencing and specifically what kind of mutations are found and other things. And eventually to Karthik, who will cover the clinical aspects of uh, the disease. When we start talking about viral infection. The first thing that I want to talk about is our cell. We in our cells have everything that is needed for making, I mean, replicating our own genetic material, copying that to make proteins, which are functional elements in the cell. And this is how our cell looks. What you see here are dots, are the factories where proteins are made constantly. And the DNA is kept in a place called nucleus and DNA is replicated and transcribed here. The transcription results in RNA, which is then pushed out into the, these places in the cytosol where you end up getting uh, proteins. So this is what we call in biology as central dogma. What originally it was thought was that DNA is the genetic material, RNA is made from that. So DNA makes itself, and in which case it's called replication and copying your own genome again and again. DNA gives rise to RNA, which is has many functions, including the fact that they contribute to uh, coding for proteins, which are the functional aspects. RNA also has many
You are muted, Vinay. You lost, but lost it, right? Yes. Yeah. Lost yes. the screen also. Okay, now is it okay? Okay. We can so hear you, but not see the screen yet. Is can you hear me? Yes, but not see okay. the screen. Okay. So what happens in uh, uh, in case of viruses? Viruses are generally not those which are living outside. Means they do not have all the machinery that is present in like. We have lost you again. Yeah, and I also can't see the slides. Yeah. Vinay, yeah. you're on mute and your screen sharing has stopped as well. That is because I'm losing the connection. I don't know why I'm losing the connection, but I'm losing the connection. Do you want to put it on mobile hotspot? That may not be a bad idea, but mobile has problems here. It's not as effective. Okay. So uh, let's hope it work works. Yeah. And I'm not going to laser pointer and all. Yes. So uh, in case of viruses, there are approximately 200 viruses that are present, which are generally not living outside. What they do is they can only live when they have a host. So viruses per se do not replicate when they are outside, but the moment they enter our body, I mean, it, it can be bacteria, in which case they are called bacteriophages. It can be other parts of the body, in which case they are called, I mean, in other, in other kind of, uh, uh, like, you know, animal viruses, and we have viruses that affect us. See, here is the list of viruses that affect us. There are so many viruses and so many things we end up getting because of viruses. There are approximately around 200 viruses that can cause the common cold that we all get and are any of the upper respiratory tract infections. The viruses per se use DNA as genetic material or can use RNA as genetic materials. And they're classified based on what kind of genetic material they use, what kind of a cell envelope they have into various subclassifications. You can see very clearly DNA virus with envelope, without envelope, whatever they have as a genetic material. So essentially they can be classified into many, many uh, subclassified to many things based on the genetic material and the proteins that are there in them, envelope or otherwise. Some of the major viruses all of you would be aware of is one of them is human influenza virus, which causes AIDS. This is actually, I mean, all of you would know about it. It is, it's been a major uh, infection in the 80s and now we are, we know how to contain it. But a lot of people actually ended up getting AIDS disease and dying because of that. And in this case, RNA is the genetic material, but it goes into the nucleus and gets integrated into our genome. So, and from there, it makes more and more RNAs and eventually butts out and makes, makes, makes virion particles. The other major infection, which we all, we all will be aware of is what we call as influenza virus or the one which causes a seasonal flu in all of us. Seasonal flu, first time, I mean, really became a pandemic way back in 1918. And here is the structure of this virus. Here also the genome is RNA virus. It's an RNA virus. And here are the proteins that are present on, uh, uh, on the top of the, uh, um, uh, on top of this virus. And these virus, these are the proteins that are used by the virus to make an entry into our cell. So the virus, when it came back way back in 1918, that was the first time the pandemic came. And you can see it over a period of two years, there were three major waves and it killed approximately four crore people in that pandemic. This was spread over two years. So how did people contain? Um, many, many things have been done. Virus has evolved and it doesn't kill people as much. And also uh, we have uh, learned to, you know, there was vaccines are there for us, uh, for, us in, for, in, for most for the flu. And also there is a drug called Tamiflu, which does not allow the release of the virus from the cell. So thereby stopping virus dividing and eventually killing the, uh, I mean, infecting the other cells. Um, this is all kind of known about uh, uh, flu infections and we kind of got used to living with it. But around two years ago, uh, one of the coronaviruses, uh, I mean, one of the novel coronaviruses came into being. This is called SARS-CoV-2. This is what causes what we know today as COVID. And what this virus is approximately, it's a single standard RNA virus. 
and it has a genome of approximately 30,000 bases in length, which is relatively large. And it encodes for approximately 30 proteins or 30 plus viral proteins. And it was first time sequenced on Jan 6, 2020. So what you see on top here, the, uh, the, um, uh, the red thing on top here is what we call a spike protein. So what is the spike used for? It is the name suggests basically the spike actually attaches to uh, a particular receptor called a receptor on our cell called ACE2 receptor and eventually spike gets cleaved and then the entry happens into our uh, cells. Once it enters the cells, the RNA gets replicated, transcribed as well as replicated. The transcription results, are the, no, the translation results in, but it doesn't get transcribed. Translation results in many um, proteins being expressed, which are required for new viral particle to be made and for it to um, replicate itself. So it makes RNA from RNA. Eventually it packages a new set of viral variants are packaged in our cells and they're pushed out and they keep on infecting the neighboring cells. But <clears throat> to give you perspective, this is how a SARS-CoV-2 looks. And we are now roughly two years into the pandemic and the number of deaths because of this pandemic is approximately 55 lakhs uh, with India contributing to approximately five lakh deaths. Major deaths still happen to uh, come from United States, but we are second in the thing with five lakh deaths in the world. Uh, 55 lakhs, compare that with four crores. That is what Haemophilus influenza actually took with it during the, that pandemic. It talks about how much the modern medicine has helped in mitigating the mortality, I mean, the kind of death one sees with such kind of infection. So again, to things again, to put in perspective, what is happening in the world is you have these waves that are coming and we are now into well into the fourth wave as far as the world is concerned. Within India, we are pretty much well into our third wave. We have, as of today, we have 1.95 lakh infections in India, 96 lakhs uh, infections in India. And this is how, um, for all of you who are interested, this is how it looks in Telangana today. Based on the reports, it has only 1,920 infections. Uh, but um, asymptomatics, there will be a lot of asymptomatic carriers who are uh, not actually testing themselves. So what is that we are doing as a CCMB or, you know, in towards this? Uh, before that, I would actually try to tell you about what is the scenario of the vaccination in India. So as, a, as in India, we have, as of today, one point, uh, sorry, 154 crore vaccine doses have been given to all the population. And we have almost covered 50% of the population with double doses and 68% of the population with single dose. Now, as of yesterday, the precautionary dose slash booster dose has started and almost 23 lakh people have already taken booster doses. So does it protect? I mean, I'm sure it's one of the questions. If you look into this graph, here is the uh, here is the grass unvaccinated are with red you get a lot of unvaccinated people get more severe cases compared to vaccine without boosters or with boosters boosters do help because it increases your immediate uh, concentration of the antibodies and many other things it kind of makes it recognition all more all the more uh, all over again so in general whether it is a severity of the in infection or uh, uh, active severe in cases, in all these cases, uh, you always have an advantage when you're vaccinated over unvaccinated individual. So if anybody were to say, oh, is vaccination not going to protect us from Omicron or any of the future waves, that is not true. It has, uh, it, it does protect us from severe, vac severe, uh, uh, severe uh, hospitalization or severe infections. Yes, it is true that uh, for uh, Omicron, the new strain that has come, which they will talk a lot more about, has a lot of mutations in the outside protein called uh, spike. Because of that, it evades the existing antibodies that are present in our body, either due to uh, prior infection or due to vaccination. So here is a comparison. The, if, if you, the existing, uh, the antibodies, that are there in anybody's body due to either vaccination from Moderna, Pfizer, or Oxford AstraZeneca is basically the uh, COVID shield vaccine. You can see that if the 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 
the uh, uh, Moderna vaccinated people can neutralize original Wuhan variants that came about two years ago quite effectively. Delta, that is what came in the, was responsible for India's second wave, not as effectively. Omicron, even less so. So that is the same case with Pfizer and the same case with AstraZeneca or the uh, COVID shield, uh, COVID shield uh, vaccine. So all these things basically tell us that, you know, um, vaccination, I mean, the prior vaccination or infection does not protect us from Omicron infection. However, the severity of the infection is a very different case because in addition to the entering the body, it, I mean, our body still has some level of next uh, adaptive T cell response, which helps in uh, mitigating the severity. And also uh, for uh, maybe because of the number of mutations it has, uh, it is one of those uh, strains which does not, uh, it is, it causes infection in the upper respiratory tract and does not spread, uh, does not cause major severe illnesses. However, these things have to be taken with a pinch of salt because we talk from the context of statistics. And uh, I mean, most of the statistics is spread across age groups. It doesn't take specifically older people who have other comorbidities would always be more affected by such infections compared to people who are uh, who are young or uh, who have less comorbidities in their own uh, in in, uh, in, uh, in their body. So uh, over a period of last one and a half two years uh, two years CCMB has done work in many aspects. Just a brief. Uh, outline of some of the work that we are involved in, um, CCMB is involved in. We worked on diagnostics and we continue to work on diagnostics. We are working on vaccines, which are important. If you are talking about any virus, there are three aspects which need to be dealt with. One, identify the virus, I mean, presence of infection fast. Second, have a vaccination to stop uh, I mean, stop the spread. And eventually, if somebody gets an infection, there has to be a treatment, which is essentially drug-like a molecule. So in addition to that, if you want to figure out where the new variants are going to emerge, we actually need to continue to do uh, surveillance. And so there is an air surveillance, zero surveillance, sewage surveillance, and genome surveillance. There are four arms to this. And we have also been involved in COVID mitigation in terms of giving seminars like the one which I am, which we are giving today. <clears throat> we were involved in, we have come up with a novel methodology at CCMB to uh, come up with uh, the, for the diagnostic. <clears throat> this is called uh, dry swab method, which cuts down the number of steps that are involved in diagnosis. And also when the samples come from interior parts of the India, they can be safely kept without uh, putting it in any kind of a liquid. So this is a uh, transport becomes easier. This was developed in, uh, in CCMB and a lot of people have been trained in this diagnostic. We are working towards mRNA vaccine. The work is in progress. We are, uh, of course, we are well aware that Moderna and Pfizer have long ago, I mean, have already developed this, but it is important to develop such kind of technologies in India so that we are ready for any future pandemics that may come out of, I mean, that may come or these as additional other advantages. This is work in progress. I thought I would show it any which way. We have also been involved in testing many drug kind of molecules from various industries and other academic industries, other academic uh, um, uh, you know, uh, institutes. Uh, one of the biggest thing that you may be knowing is about the 2 oxy glucose that is actually was tested in our facility by thing. We were involved in obviously mitigation, like giving seminars, testing out a few things like air purifiers. So if you purify the air, obviously then majority of the infections are aerosolic in nature. So if you are uh, going to clean up the air through air pure purifier or something like that, we should be able to actually have a better uh, lower spread of the infection. So we, one, one needs to survive and, I mean, figure out uh, a particular air is pure or not, specifically in hospitals. For that, there is an air surveillance uh, uh, concept that we carried out and this works quite well. We know in an area, whether in a particular area, if the virus is prevalent or not, this has not been deployed as effectively, but one can do this to figure out uh, viral load in any particular area. Um, we were involved in sewage surveillance, which is essentially uh, essentially what happens is all of us, whether we are asymptomatic or symptomatic, we shed virus in our feces 
and that can be uh, detected and one can figure out what is the viral load based on uh, multiple you know, mathematical calculations and also figure out if new variants are emerging from such kind of uh, such kind of by performing a sequence analysis and uh, we were also involved in uh, uh, generating neutralizing antibodies currently clinical trials are ongoing this was done in collaboration with wins biotechnology company these antibodies were raised in horses and eventually are purified uh, in Krishna's lab and now they are in clinical trials. So I will not talk about other things because I'm my colleague uh, uh, Tej will take over and he will talk about what kind of mutations are there in Omicron and in what way, uh, uh, what are the things that, uh, more about this. So these are his slides. The only thing that I want to basically show is a paper is it's very difficult for non-scientists to understand but i want you guys to focus on one of the aspects in wave three here is caused by delta virus and wave four is caused currently by omicron among 4400 patients in south africa this is a paper that is published in a journal scientific journal approximately 1284 people died and a lot of people had severe infections you can see the numbers there were around 3,260 received oxygen therapy. Quite a lot of them were on ventilator. Intensive care unit admissions for high length of stay was also longer. In case of Omicron, again, completely based on the data from South Africa, it appears as though the, the severity of the infection is lower. The uh, receiving oxygen is also only 17%. Uh, admission to intensive care is 185 uh, and deaths are 27. This basically does not mean that we do not take precautions and think that uh, Omicron is uh, helpful to us. Omicron is a virus, it continues to kill. You can see that there are 27 people have died among the people who got infected. And uh, what we need to be careful, especially those with uh, aged comorbidities and other things, is make sure that we actually uh, exhibit COVID, uh, COVID uh, uh, appropriate behavior in terms of wearing masks and uh, in case uh, somebody around you is infected trying to quarantine ourselves so that the infections doesn't spread uh, with this i would uh, uh, i would stop my seminar and uh, take questions if any or otherwise that can be dealt at the later point of time thank you thanks we will take the questions all together later let's go to page now Tej, you're mute. Yeah. Uh, slides are visible? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. And uh, thanks, Vinay, for the that amazing introduction and uh, getting everyone on board on what viruses are and uh, what we're dealing with currently. So uh, with that background that Vinay gave, uh, I will very quickly introduce you to the ongoing variant of concern, which is which all of you have heard of and named Omicron uh, by WHO. So uh, as you know, uh, WHO has introduced this new naming scheme of uh, naming variants uh, uh, based on Greek alphabet. And uh, Omicron is the newest one in, uh, in this list. So it was actually first noticed uh, in uh, Southern African countries uh, on around 8th November, 2021. And uh, within two weeks, uh, as, as soon as uh, 26th November, 2021, it was declared as a variant of concern. It was the fastest uh, variant, which was actually elevated to the status of variant of concern. And uh, at that time, people weren't sure why, but uh, in hindsight, it makes sense that it was actually uh, flagged at that time itself because it very quickly, uh, although it started in Southern Africa, despite all the travel bans and whatnot, it very quickly became global. Uh, all, uh, although it's 91, it's actually now more than 100 countries. Uh, it's, it's been detected, including India, of course. And what is even more impressive uh, from this variance perspective is that it is currently accountable for almost 80% of all cases worldwide. And this is happening despite the fact that in many large countries, there is an active Delta wave going on. So 
uh, in the middle of a wave by some other variant, uh, this variant is actually able to beat that in spread and you know contribute to so many cases worldwide. And uh, it also has this pangolin as assigned B1.1.529, but of course it's not much very important. So when it was initially flagged, the reason why it was flagged was because uh, it had a large number of mutations. So for example, the top part of uh, the slide, you can see that these are the total number of mutations present in Omicron. And uh, there are about 60 mutations in total. I mean, the exact number changes uh, ranges from 55 to 65, but uh, on an average, there are 60 mutations. That number itself isn't a, a concern because uh, we already know that the mutation rate of uh, SARS-CoV-2 is roughly 26 mutations every year. And given that we are uh, two years into the pandemic, having a, a variant which has uh, you know about 60 mutations is as per expectation. But what was concerning was that a large number of these mutations were present in the spike region or the spike protein of this uh, virus. And uh, if you recall the slides, what uh, when I presented earlier, this is the uh, region that interacts, or this is a protein on the viral surface which interacts with uh, the receptors on our uh, host cells, uh, the ACE2 receptor of the host cells, and thereby gaining entry into our host cells and replicating and causing infection. Now, uh, the fact that there are so many mutations in the spike protein immediately raised alarm that maybe uh, it has modified or modulated the spike protein or the structure of the spike protein in such a way that it can bypass existing immune response of the host either provided uh, by vaccine or by natural infection. And uh, some of the mutations that were also identified were actually previously uh, present in other variants of concern, such as those in Delta and those in the Beta variant, which was also from first identified in South Africa and so on. So that was the main reason. And this, the lower part actually shows in a zoomed in view of uh, all the mutations in the spike protein. Now uh, this pink area is actually called the receptor binding domain. And uh, you can see that there is a large number of mutations which are part of the receptor binding domain, which means that the, the, even within the spike uh, protein, the area which directly interacts with the ACE2 receptor, that has changed enough. So, uh, and uh, after it was reported, the next reason why it was so much of concern was how quickly it rose in frequency. So uh, uh, what you can see here on the left is, uh, is a graph uh, which depicts the frequency of Omicron variant uh, in South Africa. So as you can see that it started appearing only in an early November, but as, as soon as, or by the time December came, which is a month later, uh, almost 100% of all the new cases that were uh, coming in South Africa were due to Omicron variant. And uh, uh, of course, this is a very concerning matter. And uh, this is not limited to uh, just South Africa in almost all countries here. So this, uh, the trend lines here are for uh, a lot of countries from where uh, genomic data is available. And you can see that almost all of them where Omicron uh, has been detected, there's a very sharp increase in its frequency over time and in a very small duration. So, and that was the main thing that no matter which country uh, and whether they have an ongoing wave or not, it, this particular variant is actually able to quickly overtake other variants. Uh, and uh, this is sort of the data from India uh, for this year. And uh, this shows basically uh, a temporal shift of lineages, uh, SARS-CoV-2 lineages in India uh, for the last one year. Uh, you can see that before the second wave, it was all uh, uh, the older variants called the D614G or the N440K kind of this thing. Uh, somewhere around March or April, uh, initially we had a bit of uh, B117 or the alpha variant, which was contributing to infections in Northern India as well as Kerala. And we had this other 617.1, uh, which is also called the Kappa variant, which was uh, actually that time uh, called as double mutant or whatever. And uh, that was responsible for a large number of uh, infections in Maharashtra and all. Uh, but by the time April came and the second wave uh, was in its peak, uh, the 617.2 variant, which is the Delta variant, as well as AY lineages, which are nothing but sublineages of Delta, have quickly overtaken. And the landscape was predominantly Delta and its sublineages all the way till November. But as you can see, in December, we have this new color coming up, which is this 1.1.529 or Omicron. And very quickly, we have a large proportion of uh, Omicron coming up uh, in the new cases. And this can be appreciated even more if we look at a week-wise trend. 
So this is a basically a zoomed in version of the previous chart where uh, basically for every week we are looking at uh, the linear proportions starting from October. And you can see that in December it appeared as a small number and by the time we reach fourth week of December, uh, uh, it has now become the predominant variant. And I'm sure if we look at the data of the first week of Jan, it will be even higher. So this is how uh, it, it has quickly overtaken even in India. Uh, the other thing that you would have heard of is that how uh, there are now sublineages of Omicron. So basically, uh, all the uh, the Omicron lineage is also given the alias BA. So all the sublineages of Omicron will be called BA1, BA2, BA3, and so on. Currently, there are three such sublineages. Of course, the original one, which is BA.1, continues to be the dominant one, whereas the other two are present in very short proportions right now. What has happened is that it has lost few mutations uh, are gained of a couple of other extra mutations. Uh, these two other lineages have done that. And uh, now it is they're con continuously monitoring uh, these sublineages to see if any of them have a specific uh, growth advantages over others. And if they continue to behave, uh, you know, display mild symptoms and so on. Uh, so uh, as also uh, Vinay has pointed out, we, one of the efforts that we are trying is to actually have quick diagnostics. So what uh, when Omicron was uh, first declared as a variant of concern, we wanted to develop a new strategy which will quickly identify whether a sample is Omicron positive or not based on a simple RT-PCR. So for this, what we had done was we had actually taken data which was publicly available and identified all mutations which are unique to uh, Omicron uh, as indicated here. And uh, so basically, wherever you see this purple uh, square, it means that it's present in that particular lineage. And if it's not present in any other lineage, particularly Delta, we have picked such a uh, that as a target for specifically identifying whether it's Omicron or not. And what we have done is we designed primers uh, against each of this. And uh, we have now made it an, into an RTP circuit kind of a thing. Uh, this is how it sort of looks. I'll probably quickly explain. So basically, when you see a uh, curve like this, it means that there is uh, it's positive. Uh, or the, there is a positive signal. And if you don't see the uh, curve, then, then there is no positive signal. And uh, using this primer set, these two are sam Omicron samples and these two are Delta samples. You can see that it is the signal is coming only if, uh, if it's Omicron and not uh, if it's Delta. And uh, we have now tested it on a large number of samples and you know, we can identify whether or not it's Omicron with uh, a very good accuracy. So uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, now hand it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Karthik, who will actually go take you guys through the clinical outcomes and other uh, symptomology or biology of Omicron. Karthik, over to you. Thank you, Chish. Uh, so you can uh, uh, move to the next slide. So usually when a pandemic of an infectious agent uh, uh, progresses over a period of time, what happens is that uh, uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, because of the host survival advantages that uh, is required for the parasite or the pathogen to survive, uh, usually the pathogen becomes more infectious, evolves into a more infectious uh, agent, will develop immune escape properties and uh, will be less lethal in most cases. Though exceptions to this rule are always seen, but this is usually the way uh, you know a pathogen evolves uh, during a pandemic, and these all these characteristics we actually see with Omicron. So in the next two three slides, I'll tell you how from the data that is currently available uh, how Omicron uh, is different. Different from uh, that we had seen in the past, and uh, and all. So in this first slide, what you can see it's a, um, uh, uh, a collaboration of multiple studies. Uh, uh, so where you see that neutralizing antibody levels against this Omicron variant are less when uh, uh, compared to the previous variants in infected individuals and also vaccinated individuals with various uh, different types of vaccines. So this is that definitely neutralize Omicron to prevent infection. So, uh, and in one of the studies, uh, you know, which is being shown, I don't know whether you can see the uh, cursor or not. Uh, in the bottom right quadrant here, uh, it shows that uh, booster dose with Pfizer actually increases the uh, neutralizing capability of and uh, of the person against Omicron.
Omicron as well. But two doses for a previous infection, uh, there is less amount of antigen against Omicron. Next slide, please. Can you move to the next slide? Yeah. So this is another graph from our experience in South Africa. Uh, we can see that uh, there is a uh, six of Omicron, and it isn't uh, that much when compared to the previous peak, uh, especially the Delta peak, which actually correlates. I think your voice is breaking. Uh... You it's might want to switch. Uh, Karthik? Karthik, your voice is breaking. You might want to switch off yes, your yes. video. Okay, okay. I'm here now. I'm audible better. Sundata? Yeah, let's try. Let's try. Anyone? I'm audible. You are audible, but if you will break, you're audible, yeah. but uh, beach beach mates getting cut. Yeah, better, not so much. Okay, I'll uh, continue. Just stop me yeah. whenever I'm not clear, right? Yeah, please go ahead. So, essentially, what it's like this is that the number of cases uh, peaks. Is less than what we had seen in the del uh, uh, Delta or the previous week that South Africa had seen. Karthik, this isn't working. You might want to come to the HS office. Or try your mobile hotspot. Are you not able to hear? Are you not able to hear anything? No. <coughs> okay, give me a couple of minutes. I'll be there. Okay. In the meantime, if anyone has any question, you can raise your hand. We have the chat box also. Yeah. Ravindra Aran. Uh, Shrikant, can you please unmute Ravindra Aran? Thank you for the wonderful session, ma'am. Yeah, please ask your question. Yeah, would be the treatment protocol for Omicron would be the same or uh, it's a different, uh, can you kindly enlighten me? Yeah, I, ideally Karthik would be the person to talk about it. I'm sure he will touch on it. Yeah, Karthik, um, you already have a question that you yeah. might want to address. Uh, Mr. Ravindra wants to know if the treatment regime for Omicron remained the same. Would you be yeah, addressing that be in your same. talk now? or No, no. Okay. It is the same. <clears throat> so okay. Nothing changes actually. Uh, so Anyway, I'll just finish off with the yes, presentation yes. and then we can take Sure, it. sure. Thank you. Uh, so here we can see that uh, though the cases have uh, uh, peaked higher than what they, uh, they had seen in the Delta wave, the number of deaths has been less. And this is another slide which shows uh, comparison of the Omicron wave when compared to the other waves that South Africa had seen. Again, you can see the slope of the curve with the Omicron uh, uh, wave is extremely high when compared to the other variants. And now uh, there is a similar uh, kind of slope when it is decreasing as well. So essentially, uh, what it, what these uh, slides actually mean uh, means is that the virus has become more infectious, and it also from the for, uh, from experience in more uh, you know vac uh, countries where vaccination has had been a um, very prevalent phenomenon, and most of the uh, population is vaccinated, it has also developed a significant immune escape properties as well. Uh, and uh, from the uh, from from the experience in South Africa, we can also see uh, that the number of deaths that are happening currently uh, 
uh, in the fourth wave uh, that it has been seeing is very less when compared to the previous waves. So 2.7 versus 29.1 percent actually shows you the um, uh, death uh, difference in the severity of the infections that we're seeing with Omicron. Uh, but uh, word of caution is that you're still seeing the 2.7 percent deaths. And uh, this is from the experience that UK had uh, uh, with the Omicron wave. Here you can see that though the cases have risen uh, very steeply uh, when compared to the previous waves, the number of ventilated uh, patients or deaths have almost uh, uh, been uh, you know parallel to what is happening, what was happening previously. So, uh, and in in UK, you know that most of the people are uh, uh, vaccinated. So. In, uh, in general, uh, you know, vaccination offers a good protection even for the Omicron variants against uh, severe outcomes. Uh, whereas uh, there is significant amount of immune escape with this Omicron variant, so even vaccinated people uh, tend to get infected. But uh, again, in, case, in uh, cases where uh, vaccination or uh, you know, pre-existing immunity due to previous infection may not be that much, there might be higher number of deaths when compared to uh, an advanced country like UK. So here in this slide, uh, you know, uh, countries which have 20 to 30 percent vaccination and probably less developed healthcare or less developed or organized healthcare system tend to have more deaths. So the red peak is going up more, which was parallel to the uh, flat line in the UK. So uh, in places where immunity, pre-existing immunity is not good, either because of vaccination or previous infection, uh, people are still likely to die, at least especially high-risk individuals. So with that, I would like to finish. Uh, uh, to summarize, Omicron has more infectivity. That means it spreads to more number of people. It spreads faster, uh, uh, see, uh, as shown by the uh, steep rise in the cases. It has immune escape because uh, there is reduced neutralization uh, in many uh, multiple vaccine, vaccinated individuals with multiple vaccines. And also in uh, even in countries where uh, pre-existing immunity is there because of infections. Uh, for, for example, in our country, there is a steep rise of cases showing that a significant uh, epidemiological or clinical evidence also exists for immune escape phenomena. And from whatever data is available so far from across the countries, the disease tends to be milder. And the prognosis is better, but word of caution again, high-risk individuals are uh, still probably at equivalent risk when compared to uh, the, other, uh, variant, uh, the other previous variants. So with this, I would like to end and then acknowledge uh, so many people who have been working with us in uh, you know, sequencing, testing, and developing a lot of diagnostic products and uh, uh, throughout the COVID uh, pandemic uh, at CCMP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karthik, as well as Vinay and Tej. Uh, now, there are a few questions in the question answer box. We'll address those, and I will also uh, tell our um, audience that if you want to ask a question personally, you can raise your hand, we'll unmute you and you can ask, you can discuss with our scientists. Let's start with uh, Mamta's question. Is there any difference in symptoms of Omicron and Delta variant? Karthik? Yeah, I'll uh, take that uh, question. So uh, the symptoms have been milder so far uh, with Omicron variant. Most people reported uh, you know, mild headache, uh, uh, a milder fevers, some people just had sore throat. And then number of asymptomatic individuals is also, uh, percentage is also higher when compared to the previous phase. Uh, and uh, when compared to the original, uh, uh, you know, strain and other things, things like uh, anosmia, I mean, loss of smell and all are also not available. Delta also had shown some, uh, you know, signs of increased transmissibility, like uh, when compared to the first strain, Delta uh, infected individuals showed uh, more amount of sneezing or diarrhea where you know virus can be excreted and spread to other uh, place where the virus could be spread to other people but omicron again it is mostly upper respiratory tract so symptoms similar to uh, uh, you know regular cough cold kind of mild sure. okay um we'll move to the next question by dr jay yadav can omicron not spread if you're sitting for half an hour with an infected person but wearing mask so basically we are wearing masks and one of us is infected, what are the chances of still transmitting the virus? So the chances would be less, uh, but the multiple factors actually regulate it. The type of mask that you are wearing. So an N95 mask offers uh, a bit, uh, better protection. The place where you are sitting. So if you are sitting in a venti vent, uh, very much ventilated space, uh, you know, maybe a park or something, uh, again, the chances are going to be less. And, uh, and also your immune status. 
if you are previously vaccinated or infected, maybe uh, it is less likely that you'll carry you'll catch the infection. Away. So a well ventilated, preferably an open area, less crowded area, and a better mask just makes us safer. But there's always a risk. Is the diagnosis of Omicron variant the same RT-PCR test or sequencing? Page might want to take this. Or then I. So uh, uh, at regular it's RTPCR different. picks up COVID infection uh, with Omicron or any other variant. Uh, at least whatever kits that we are in, we are using in our country uh, will pick up, will light up if it is uh, COVID Omicron or Delta. But to definite, uh, definitively say whether the, you are infected with Omicron or Delta, we need further uh, testing. Now certain kits are available which can detect uh, the type of the virus using RTPCR only. But gold standard would be to sequence and then identify the viral spread. Okay. Uh, we have a question on YouTube as well, which asks, is the booster dose sufficient for, is the booster dose enough for Omicron? Basically, will the booster dose help? So it does uh, provide protection, but it is not going to uh, completely neutralize the Omicron because the antibodies, I mean, specificity is not as much but the concentration go, goes up, it would provide you some level of protection compared to not having it. <laughs> so Tej, uh, Lakshmi is asking a question which you might be best positioned to answer. Um, do you see any other variations within the samples that we are getting? And is there a possibility in your future to have another variant of concern like Delta as the virus is mutating well, continuously? Yes, so the virus keeps mutating and we do pick up a lot of uh, uh, novel mutations uh, in Omicron also, which is why, for example, we now have the three sub-lineages and we'll continue to have more sub-lineages. Whether any of them will become a new variant of concern, I mean, we can only hope not. And uh, uh, there is no saying it. Like, I think, for example, we're just lucky this time that Omicron, you know, is having a milder disease like if, if it also had a uh, you know uh, if it was just let's say as bad as delta or something we would have been in far more trouble mm -hmm. so uh, the best that we can do is you know not give virus a chance to mutate further and that, that uh, can only happen by taking appropriate precautions but yeah there, there's absolutely every possibility that uh, i mean the virus will continue to mutate and there's every possibility that there could be a new variant of virus. Oh, okay. The next question, which is from YouTube by Rajesh Ray, is on similar vein. How this, how is it that this spike protein of coronavirus mutating so rapidly? Yeah. So, so uh, the the thing is uh, something called uh, selection pressure. So, uh, because a spike binding to our receptor is the first step for the virus to be able to infect us. Uh, and uh, most of the times, that's the part exposed to the immune system, and most of our uh, protective mechanisms are also against that. Uh, it is advantageous for the virus to you know, mutate at that region so that it can bypass existing immunity or as well as infect better. So spike is under much more selection pressure, evolutionary pressure than rest of the genome. That's why we see more, more and more mutations coming in spike. Thanks. Uh, Vinay, the next question is probably meant the best for you. So some people as, I mean, this is from Dr. R. K. Tyagi from Amiti University. Uh, some people are saying that after Omicron, the pandemic will end. So this is also in similar line as that the variant is actually a natural vaccine. So what are your thoughts on this as an immunologist? So I think it's uh, um, actually we will have antibodies against Omicron after this particular pandemic. But whether the newer variants that will emerge at a later point of time get neutralized, by the antibodies that we are going to have against Omicron is anybody's guess at this point of time. As Tej said, if new variant emerges that actually can evade, in, uh, evade the existing uh, antibodies that are present at the immunity and has more virulence, we can have. So we, it's, it's, it's anybody's guess. But what happens is that we have better mitigating mechanisms 
and the drugs will come up like you know if you look into influenza virus at this point of time not only the vaccine we also have a drug called tamiflu same way i think currently there is a pfizer has a drug for uh, uh, for sars cov 2 infection or covid so if we we attack the problem from both ends we will be in a better position to to handle the infections going forward and i mean obviously science is evolving so you can very clearly say that um, compared to the spanish flu we had much less in terms of deaths and uh, we know how to kind of handle it better as the time progresses mm-hmm. uh, but it's it's only wishful thinking right now with respect to this is the last variant mm-hmm. <laughs> so actually another question on youtube is probably a continuation of that uh, by shubham raj what are the reasons that omicron symptoms are mild or milder than delta so there was uh, there was one study that published uh, i don't recall where but you know basically it says that it one is that it infects the upper res- it seems to be infecting the upper respiratory part of the lung i mean not the lower and the second is that it's, it doesn't um replicate as efficiently in that particular study that was published so it has certain issues maybe what we call sometimes when you accumulate as many mutations there is a what we call as a fitness cost associated with accumulating as many mutations you evolve towards better infectivity but somewhere along the way you lost the ability the cleavage is not efficient as efficient you know the when it entering so the entry is not as efficient as it is for delta and the replication after that is not as these aspects are contributing to it but more science will come with time mm-hmm. in so, the lungs i mean the, <coughs> so entry and uh, replication in the lung cells that's what you know yeah um uh, so Piyush the other one youtube is asking then do, i mean some people have been commenting on omicron as an evolutionary mistake so how does one go about thinking about it. something like this no it's not a evolutionary mistake it's how evolution happens that's how i started of the talk yeah so whenever a pandemic progresses you know if the virus has to survive its host has to survive if the virus is killing the host itself it it has no way to spread right it has to get into some kind of symbiotic mechanism where it survives and also the host survives so that it spreads more so eventually selection takes it in such a way yeah. that viruses which spread more but have less lethality actually uh, accumulate in the population hmm. and it so, is advantageous to us because uh, the milder the disease is the more, uh, it's like less likely to be a significant public health problem so nobody writes about common cold diseases right hmm. Hmm. so uh rajesh ray is asking uh we have seen different different strains of co- coronavirus affecting rapidly in different age groups what are the causes behind this if i understand this question correctly he is trying to ask why is coronavirus affecting different age groups and different ages karthik sorry i missed the question can you sorry i missed the question uh, wh- why why does the virus affect different different age groups and different ways uh so different age groups are likely to have different levels of immunity uh you know if, you know i'm i'm assuming that you're asking about the difference in outcomes between pediatric population versus adult yeah. population yeah, yeah. so uh, pediatric uh, population uh, probably uh, will have a higher level of uh, you know nascent immunity and which enables them to fight uh, neutralize the virus uh, in the respiratory tract itself whenever it comes uh, and that is the postulated uh, uh, mechanism uh and adults tend to have more uh, other comorbidities like diabetes hypertension and uh, decrease amount of t cell or nascent uh, uh, immune responses which will make uh, the virus more uh, uh, you know dangerous to adult population so uh, you know a lot of work is going on to understand why these differences happen still not extremely clear mm-hmm. uh the next question is around the booster dose of the vaccine what is the recommended time between the second dose and the booster dose um so uh, ideally 6 to 9 months at least um, no um, and uh, i i don't think there is uh, good data from uh, any of the countries to tell that this is a perfect uh, interval but essentially from what other vaccines do Uh, any interval between 6 months to 1 year uh, would work well for a booster dose mm-hmm. all right 
So I guess that's all the questions. I mean, one question, which was uh, death is more or less in Omicron cases. So there is one I see in the chat. So yeah, death is it's more or less. It is definitely less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, there's another. Okay, there's another question. If an individual is given different kinds of vaccines, will it provide more protection against coronavirus variants by generating antibodies to different parts of the virus? I think that's a very good question. Yeah, so uh, there are two ways where how you can give a uh, booster dose. One is uh, giving it with the same uh, vaccine that you had received earlier. And another is with a different uh, um, make. So... And again, uh, this is being recently explored in various countries, especially with, uh, uh, with COVID, uh, COVID viruses only. Otherwise, uh, cross-vaccination was previously not uh, you know, a recommended thing. But from whatever uh, studies that have happened so far, this heterologous uh, uh, vaccination, where you give a different uh, vaccine from a different make as a booster dose, actually works well. In some cases, uh, much better than giving it homologous vaccination, where you just take the same vaccine that you had taken in the initial uh, one or two settings. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, probably because uh, you know every vaccine also comes along with its vehicle. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, the vehicle and the vehicle also stimulates uh, immune response whenever it is injected. So because the vehicle is usually larger, uh, the virus, adenovirus or something. So when you give booster with the same thing, body actually develops antibodies against the adenovirus vehicle also. So there will be earlier neutralization, which results in less uh, immune response. But if the vehicle changes from adenovirus to say other protein-based or ILM-based thing, there is a greater chance that the core protein against which you are trying to produce immunity actually reaches the immune system and stimulates the immune system well. So heterologous vaccination has done well, but in that sense, uh, as a booster, even homologous vaccination will help you to increase your uh, back, uh, antibody levels to afford protection against the virus. Okay. 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 Um, Amita Thakur on what YouTube wants to understand the Indian data about Omicron currently uh, in a little bit more detail. Would they want to come on to this? Like how, what is the proportion of Omicron in all the cases that we see? How is it changed? I mean, is it uniform across states of India? And anything else that we might know? Maybe it's not exactly uniform right now, but it will be uniform pretty much. If not already, it will be pretty much uniform uh, very soon in the sense that it will be 100% Omicron. That's what... Uh, uh, so uh, also... How quickly uh, the proportion is changing is slightly biased because initially there was a lot of sampling happening from travelers. So it was a it was so we were sequencing more and more of travelers compared to the community samples. So there could be some bias coming from there. But at this point in community, it, at least in places where there is massive spike like Delhi and Mumbai, uh, they are mostly Omicron. Mm -hmm. okay. Even in the travelers, actually, I yeah. uh, you know we have seen we have seen a. Uh, uh, significant change. So initially, you know, December and all, maybe one or two cases would be positive for Omicron. Now, and now 100% of traveler yeah. samples are positive for Omicron. So it has changed worldwide and it is going to change in India. Like yeah, even in Telugu states, it's that way. Hmm. Uh, we see some comment there. Yeah, yeah. I think they are asking for uh, community spread in Telangana and AP. That's the question. So in percentage of the community samples, what is the spread? So we don't have, uh, um, I mean, direct data from Telangana, but from AP, uh, it's almost all on the ground right now. Okay. So I would say something, it would be similar in Telangana. All the way yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, moving on to diagnostics. Uh, some people say that correct diagnostic diagnosis does not happen with rapid antigen test. I'm assuming he meant rapid antigen, uh, Mamta meant rapid antigen testing, uh, while RT-PCR gives correct diagnosis. So can you please explain how these two different tests work and how we should understand the sensitivity and accuracy? So rapid antigen test actually uh, uses a protein component uh, and then tries to uh, use antibodies which are developed against the protein to identify whether such a protein is present in the sample that has been uh, being tested or not. Whereas RT-PCR actually looked at the nucleic acid material. So 
just by the num- uh, sensitivity uh, you know a pcr based uh, technology is likely to be more sensitive to than compared to a protein based detection so in that sense rt pcr is much more sensitive i mean out of 100 positive cases so rt pcr can detect about 70% of the cases whereas antigen based test would detect about 50 to 60% of the cases so that is the sensitivity so 20 to 30% even rt pcr could not will not be able to detect because of multiple reasons you know time of sampling uh, at what which stage of the illness has been has the sample been taken uh, the processing methods what were used in that and sometimes because of the mutations in the uh, virus itself can cause certain uh, abnormalities in the testing results yeah there is a question on sense of smell in the comments oh th- uh, there are also two other questions in the question and answer box let me take those first um and this is probably for you when i am best positioned is it true that the disease will enter an endemic phase in the near future i would ask you to also explain endemic before you go on to answer this so pandemic means it's all over the across the world endemic means it's it's happening in smaller pockets can once something is happening in hyderabad but may not be happening in delhi or something is happening in us but not in europe that is what we call endemic disease i think general predictions are people do think that the experts do think that it would eventually become an endemic and uh, most probably this will eventually go towards endemic disease but time frame i mean hope, is this the end of it i mean i really hope so but you know uh, more of uh, really difficult to predict but people generally think that major virologists and across the board think that it is going towards endemic mm-hmm. and you will end up having more local pockets and seasonal seasonal outbreaks compared to having whole world experiencing a wave hmm. well, and if it turns out to be endemic how would that be different for us in leading lives would the concern still remain the same as uh, as it is mentioned earlier i think if in, in the long run virus actually evolves towards more sustenance so we will have infections but the outcomes may not be as severe as they were during say delta wave mm. right right now already you can see that happening with omicron i mean that you know the outcomes are not as severe like death or you know hospitalization and other things and and also that our body we have seen this virus over a period of time our ability to recognize a new variant coming even if not because of the antibodies because of the t cell immunity would be higher and also the um, i mean there will be other things that are available to us other kind of medicines that will be available to us so we, we would be able to better handle it and endemic basically means a particular place going up so yeah it will be a problem say in bombay may not be in as much in hyderabad that kind of a thing mm-hmm. but current as of today it is still a pandemic mm-hmm. are there any precautions to be taken uh, for taking vaccines karthik would you want to take that uh, so if somebody is allergic to any component of the vaccine then it should be strictly administered under uh, you know uh, medical supervision you have to consult your doctor before actually taking a particular vaccine if you have a significant amount of allergy uh, you know which can sometimes lead to a sudden drop in blood pressure and can cause death uh, so those are the things that you should completely avoid otherwise uh, uh, you know for all practical purposes nothing else needs to be done if you are infected currently then it is better not to take at least for another 4 to 6 weeks uh, once your infection gets cleared if you are uh, in any kind of medical situation admitted in a hospital and all you can probably wait till that uh, situation improves so if apart from that uh, uh, if you have uh, yeah if you have taken any antibody therapy in the recent past and all or a blood transfusion say plasma therapy and all then you will probably have to wait a bit to vaccinate but i mean those are not absolute uh, contraindications or something that which prevent you from taking a vaccine but absolute contraindication would be only uh, you know significant allergy to any vaccine component okay so yashomita is asking when someone is infected they show symptoms of loss of smell and taste uh, how long does it take for those senses to come back so uh, now in this period i don't think any 
uh, one is complaining of that loss of smell or taste. If it happens, it's usually because of blockage of your nose, because of lot of secretions and all. That can also cause loss of uh, smell and taste. And uh, how far, how fast it returns back depends on the individual. People uh, report recovery in two three days after the symptom onset to say a few months also. So there is a lot of variation in how many days it takes for uh, one to get back is their senses. Mm-hmm. Uh, it shouldn't last more than one or two weeks. Hmm. All right. Ramesh Shetty is asking, uh, "Are we? I mean, he is basically wanting to know our views on herd immunity for uh, for the virus. So, can we comment on that? Like, are we in the herd immunities? I mean, are we are we in a situation where we can say that there is herd immunity? I think we should start with the definition of herd immunity yeah. for people." Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> Even around 70% of the people approximately are infected in a population. Virus doesn't, our virus as any particular organism doesn't have many other people to infect. But what has happened is that uh, people who, I mean, Omicron variant does not seem to realistically care about the prior infection of it data or even the vaccination. So people are getting reinfected by Omicron. So now we again have to reach a point where Omicron doesn't have that space. So if the new variant, which eventually later on emerges, has that ability, then the existing immunity coming from this set of infection may not prevent us from getting another one. Mm -hmm. Severities are very different set of questions. Mm -hmm. So talking of immune escape, Piyush Yadav's question on YouTube is a continuation. Uh, when we talk of Omicron escaping the immune response, um, are we only basing it on the studies of uh, neutralizing antibodies or also T-cell responses? Most of them are from uh, uh, neutralization of the antibodies. T-cell immunity still works. Hmm. That I think has been done and it still works. So neutralization is where the major studies are. And we already know that people who are uh, infected with previously with Delta, are, they are getting reinfected pretty heavily uh, with Omicron. So we do know that immune escape, immune escape mm-hmm. happens. Okay. All right. Uh, Vandana Manchinda has a very basic question, but an important one. How does a vaccine work? Well, Karthi, you want to take that? Uh, so vaccine essentially tries to uh, prepare yourself. It's like, uh, you know, yourself getting trained in karate or taekwondo before you get into the actual fight. So if you're trained well, you know, uh, the other person might not come near you at all. Or even if, if they dare to come, you can uh, defeat him in the fight that you'll, you're going to have. So vaccination uh, uh, you know, injects an inactive uh, viral material, whether it is a nucleic acid or uh, protein or anything. Uh, which stimulates immune system, which prepares immune system for any potential infection in the future. Your immune system is already prepared by the time you encounter the virus or pathogen, so it will better be able to fend off uh, the disease. So I would give a different analogy to this. The analogy for me is like, you know, you know the identity of a thief who's entering your house. But now the thief comes back with a beard, you may not be able to sufficiently de- figure out that, you know, that is a thief. But nevertheless, you will have certain features which you can still recognize. So when you actually make your body aware of the person for the first time, you actually can recognize the enemy next time around when they come. That's, that is what is vaccination all about. And uh, continuing on that, Smriti Bajpai wants to know how does a nasal vaccine work? So, uh, so nasal vaccine um, is, uh, you know, essentially a different route of administration. So, uh, coronavirus, for example, you know, is predominantly a respiratory virus, and uh, for every organ system in our body, there is a uh, system-specific immunity that exists. So, skin will have a different set of, uh, you know, uh, immune cells which respond to skin infections. Similarly, mucosal tract, lung will have its own defense system. The uh, gastrointestinal tract will have its own defense system. So, because it, because coronavirus is primarily a respiratory uh, uh, tract infection, you know, having uh, immunity at the point of entry might actually be more beneficial. So, when you are taking a vaccine, you are taking a, a you know shot in the, your muscle. So, you are 
generating a systemic immune response. So your blood will have enough adequate immune uh, uh, cells and also antibodies which can prevent systemic spread of the virus. But whether that will sufficiently stimulate your respiratory tract uh, to have those same degree of uh, protection, we do not know yet. But a nasal vaccine is likely to stimulate the immune cells that are present in the respiratory tract. And that therefore, at the entry level, it will give better uh, uh, benefits. And it's also non-invasive. It's easy to administer for children and all. You can just take a puff, uh, okay. nasal uh, puff, and then that's it. Nothing else needs to be done. Okay. All right. Um, this is kind of um, a question that you also addressed earlier, Karthik, but still, is it possible to take Covaxin and Covishield vaccines alternatively? Um, it is possible. I mean, it's safe for all practical purposes and it is effective, but currently government guidelines do not stipulate that, so okay. we cannot take it that. Okay. As a part of some study, possibly yes, but not as okay. per government guidelines. Okay. Uh, how do we calculate evolution rate of coronavirus or any virus? What is that question? Well, how do we calculate the evolution rate of the coronavirus? So it's calculated based on the genome sequencing. Mm -hmm. So uh, every time uh, we sequence the sample, we compare that sequence to the original Wuhan reference mm -hmm. and see how many mutations have accumulated. And because we have multiple sequences coming from a specific time point, we can say, okay, this is the average number of mutations that the virus has accumulated in this much time. So based on that, you can identify, okay, in let's say in a year, on an average, these are the number of mutations uh, that occur. Of course, it's not uh, a constant thing. As I said, it's just the average, depending on the host. For example, in immunocompromised hosts, uh, the evolution is much faster. So accumulation of mutations is much faster. Uh, whereas if someone has a much stronger defense, it could be slower or maybe it didn't make a mistake that time. So it's not an absolute number, but on an average, based on genome sequences, we know uh, what's the mutation rate. Right? So, so there is a question on SARS-CoV-2 virus is mutating fast. What are the reasons behind it? I'll take this. Really, it's not SARS-CoV-2 is mutating. Mutations is a natural phenomenon. Every time a genome is copied, there will be certain mutations that will happen because there is an enzyme that is involved called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which copies the genome of 30,000 bases to make a new genome. So every time it goes through, there will be certain mistakes the polymerase makes. So these kind of mistakes that are made, some of them are advantageous for the virus to keep, some of them are disadvantageous for the virus. All those mutations which are formed which are disadvantages would be eliminated because there is no selection pressure for them to be retained. And for all those mutations, which are advantages for the virus, and that provides a certain advantage in the terms of whether you, know, you have to evade the antibody ex response, existing antibody response or whatever, they got start getting in positively selected. So that is how the mutations go towards, uh, they get selected eventually. As they just now said, if you're an immunocompromised individual, means you can harbor the virus longer in your body and it can go through multiple rounds of replication in the body. And the more rounds of replication it goes through, more mutations you can accumulate and more things get selected over a period of time. All right. <clears throat> So um, in the question answer box on Zoom now, there are quite a few questions that have come up. Uh, while deciding for a booster dose, are there any precautions while taking a hetero dose? Can one source of vaccine counteract the other one? Basically, will co-vaccine counteract on Covishield or vice versa? Or, or there are many others now also. And at present, nothing specific. Okay. Uh, why should we not take vaccines when infected with COVID? So when you're infected, uh, you already have an immune stimulus, right? Uh, the virus is actually replicating in you. It does the same thing that the vaccine will do. It stimulates immunity. So that is one reason when you're actively infected, you shouldn't take. Another reason is that if you develop severe disease, you do not know whether it is because of the drug that you have taken or the disease uh, per, uh, per se. And immediately after the infection, say for, uh, for six weeks or so, uh, the, any any other booster also, I mean, in general, you know, if, if vaccine requires a booster dose, it's usually after one month they give booster dose because your immune system will not recognize this vaccine as a newer insult. 
it will think it is continuation of the older one and then uh, there is some amount of energy it, it's not useful at all in simulating additional energy in this mm-hmm. um if someone is covid positive then after how many days one should go for the next rt pcr test presumably uh, if, to get a negative report yeah repeat rt pcr test is not recommended uh, even for uh, the older uh, strains and all beyond 9 days uh, most people fail to culture even and you know, the virus from the uh, nasal secretion so even if rt pcr is positive so that is the reason uh, you know 9 to 10 days period was the recommended uh, isolation uh, uh, period and even if rt pcr is positive after that you might not really be infectious and for other practical purposes and all it is not recommended uh, for you to test uh, you know again and again once positive that should be enough you need not have a negative report before you interact with others or uh, go to the office but you have to com- uh, complete your isolation period do the symptoms of omicron i mean are the symptoms of omicron variant milder due to mutations in the variant or due to vaccines possibly both okay uh, how long is the cycle of virus uh, in an individual so basically how long does the virus stay in an individual it varies uh, you know between 5 to to 14 days usually what are the differences between antigen and antibody especially given that we use these words in the diagnostic tests i think it's important uh, it's probably homework i guess <laughs> <laughs> what is the question what is the difference between antigen and antibody antigen in this case is spike protein or various parts of the spike protein what happens is when the spike goes into your body it gets eventually kind of fragmented like when it is presented by the immune cells and presented it to uh, in one way or the other self cells and that those are recognized by antibodies that are made by your b cells so antibodies are the ones which recognize the antigen in this case is spike right All right. Okay. So, Raja, please go ahead. Of, uh, sorry. Antigen is part of a pathogen. Yeah. It's a part of a pathogen. Antibody is your oh. sword against it. Yeah. So, the reason I did not say pathogen is because sometimes you can have autoimmunity. <laughs> <laughs> I think for that this. question, we don't have to go into autoimmunity. <laughs> uh, so, now there is one particular question, I think, which uh, I think they should address. sir we know that virus is traveling or mutating like sometimes in china and sometimes in south africa it's like why is it evolving in different parts of the world is the question essentially okay so it's it's not that way it's not happening at any specific place it just happens where it is first identified okay uh, you cannot say that it mutated in south africa or mutated in india or mutated in uk any of it's just that it was identified there and that too by the time you are identifying it it has like for example omicron has 60 mutations right like and out of which 36 are in spike now many of those mutations were present from long time so all that together is what is making it omicron so you cannot say at what point it suddenly you know ended up becoming omicron it's it's a continuous process it happens it can happen anywhere it can be identified anywhere so there is no uh, nothing like virus prefers to mutate at a specific location geographical location or anything like that it's about how where the surveillance is happening just by chance yes just by chance why the variant is known as b1.1.529 okay so that's a nomenclature system that was put in place to track very uh, precise changes in the uh, genome of the virus uh, which is why uh, i mean so basically uh, initially the ancestral virus was called a then the first sublineage is called b and the first sublineage of that is b.1 and so on so 529 is basically uh, the 529th sub lineage of b.1.1 so it's a way of saying that this is this is how it has spanned during its evolutionary course of time of course these names are very difficult to remember which is why we now have the easier to remember system which is the greek alphabet for important lineages all right raghav is here he wants to ask a question personally raghav please go ahead
Okay, until Raghav speaks, um, this question is interesting. Can too many shots uh, cause a sort of immune system fatigue, compromising the body's ability to fight the virus? So is it something, is there anything like too many shots that is bad for the immune system? <laughs> Karthik, I have no idea about this. <laughs> So far, it's not been documented. Uh, fatigue in the sense it might not work. There can be energy, but it does not mean that it will not be uh, effective against the pathogen. Okay. So it, it, it's not like if I take too many vaccines, my immune system will get bad or something. No, but you'll have uh, side effects every few months. So you might as well get COVID. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, does COVID happen to animals and birds as well? That's a question from YouTube. The short answer is yes. Whether it's exactly like those in uh, humans, uh, there is, there's not enough data. But yes, animals can get COVID. Uh, and uh, sometimes the symptomology is also there. Yeah. I don't know if birds, uh, I don't know if it's uh, identified in birds so far. We've only seen it in mammals. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone reported in birds, but uh, I could be wrong. Yeah. No, flu is not in birds. There is a question on how to meet any scientist like Dr. C. N. Rao. <laughs> See, the way it is generally used, you will have to write to them. And most of these people are public figures and they have email addresses which are accessible. And uh, you write to them and uh, they, they would generally quite a lot of them end up answering it depends on the scientist i cannot speak for the next person <laughs> talking of ccmb we have a pro, i mean we have many outreach activities where you in pre covid days you could come to the campus and meet all of us in person now it's online and hopefully we will again be in a position to conduct the physical events but online is there for the time being Okay, Hina Malik wants to know this. We are getting negative results despite of symptoms when nasal swabs were taken for the test. Shouldn't the strategy be changed for this variant and take oral swabs as it is multiplying in URT? No, so nasal and oral does not make any difference. In fact, nasal has better sensitivity. That is the reason it is recommended. Hmm. Most RT PCR tests actually look at two or three genes. So it's unlikely that the uh, test reports are falsely negative uh, because the symptoms are not very you know specific to COVID disease. So the same symptoms could be because of a rhinovirus infection or some other upper respiratory tract infection. You might probably be, be infected by other pathogen. That is one issue. And the other thing is that the tests that we do also have limited sensitivity. In not all cases we'll be able to detect. That is a few negatives would be there. Those are false negatives. And uh, if you are infected by some other virus or, for example, they have allergy and you have symptoms, uh, those are actually true negatives. Hmm. All right. So one of the, one yes, of the things that I told in the uh, first one of the initial slide, there are 200 viruses which can cause common cold. So it's not necessary that everything that you have is because of Omicron. Yeah. Or coronavirus for that matter. Yeah. Uh, this is, I'm going to take this as the last question and which is again on the vaccine combination uh, cocktail. In terms of heterologous vaccines, can mRNA vaccines be taken with inactivated virus-based vaccines? Yeah, if available, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there was, it was like a flurry of questions that came from both Zoom and YouTube. Um, pl plenty of things, most of them on vaccines. So vaccines are good. Vaccines are still effective and also effective against Omicron. So do take them. Mm -hmm. And the usual COVID appropriate behavior holds as true as it was last year. Stay away from crowds if you can. Be in well ventilated spaces and <clears throat> observe hand hygiene. Use the masks and take your vaccine shots. So with that, I'll close the session today. Thank you all very, very much for joining us and for the lovely questions. And a special thanks to our speakers, Vinay, Tej, and Karthik. Thank you all.